Okay, good afternoon again. A warm welcome to all our participants from the side of VU Vienna and our today's speakers team. My name is Barbara. I'm working at the Institute for Managing Sustainability at Vienna University of Economics and Business, together with the head of our institute, André Martinuzzi. Hello, André. We will guide you through this webinar session today. In this webinar today, the urgent and pressing topic of motivation and engagement in distance teaching will be addressed. How to keep motivation in distance teaching high. We are happy that again, so many experts followed our invitation. We have again a very international audience from five different continents and more than 20 different countries. Welcome everybody. Let me say some introductory words why we conduct this webinar. Since the COVID-19 crisis hit our world, Aus Austria is currently in the second uh, lockdown, as, as many of you uh, probably know. This uh -huh. teaching and home learning became the new normal in higher education. Since spring this year, we provide a vibrant expert forum for sharing insights, exchange of best practices, and effective knowledge transfer within the Living Innovation Project, which is being funded. Next slide, please. We already conducted three webinars um, during the spring and autumn, um, where we facilitated the following topics uh, as experience-based learning in distance teaching, humor in distance teaching, and gaming and VR in distance teaching. If you're interested in one of those topics, feel free to join the news section on livinginnovation.com and you can find the recordings there. Before André will introduce um, our today's speakers, uh, let me say some rules. Please use the chat function for questions anytime. We will have about 20 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions and answers. Please mute yourself unless you speak, and please switch on your camera if the moderator addresses you. Switch on your camera if, if the moderator addresses you. I also want to point out that we record this webinar, so if you want to participate but you don't want to be seen, please switch off your camera. Before we jump into the topic, let me ask an introductory question. Next slide, please. We would ask you to write into the chat what you're interested in by typing in two things. Are you here to share or to learn? And one sentence on what you would like to learn. So please take a minute and use the chat function and just let us know a little bit deeper about your today's motivation. Hello, Lydia. Please also specify um, which areas you're interested in. Hands on ideas. <laughs> Classroom atmosphere. Mm -hmm. The classes. Keeping me myself motivated as an instructor. Okay. How to plan seminars. How to survive block lectures. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for your contributions. I'm sure um, 
our today's experts will address uh, multiple of these points. Uh, we have uh, BMM, BML Munchal University uh, India with us today. We have uh, Bocconi School of Management and University of St. Gallen. And I will hand over to Andre now. He will um, shortly introduce our today's speakers. Next slide, please. And again, please um, feel free to ask uh, your questions in the chat and the speakers as well as the moderators. We'll come back to your questions. Thank you. Okay, so good morning in case you're in Europe. Good evening in case you're in Asia. Good early morning in case you're in the US or in the Americas. We have so many participants from all around the world and well, uh, good night or whatever you would like to say in Australia. I think it's the wrong time to attend this kind of course now, this kind of webinar. Wherever you come from, welcome and thanks for joining. When we talk about motivation, um, then we should ask the question, what do we mean by motivation? So, do we follow a kind of instrumental motivation theory? What does this mean? Well, you know, when you have this idea, then students study at universities to get a degree. They get a degree because they want to get a good job. They want to get a good job because later on they want to drive a big car. They want to get a good job, not because of the car, but also because of the house, because they want to have a, have a big house. And all of this together, they will have a wealthy family. They will even be rich, and then they will die rich and have a wonderful funeral. So this is a kind of instrumental motivation theory. One is done on purpose of achieving the next one. If we would like to follow this kind of motivation theory, we have to tell our students about their future chances. Because when we think they use a kind of instrumental approach, they do something for the sake of the next, next, next step. And we just simply have to tell them what their great future chances will be. This is so easy how, would, how motivation would look like from an instrumental point of view. But there are other approaches. Um, if we have follow a social motivation theory, well, then we have to give them the right uh, setting. So, for example, if you jog alone, if you run on the street during lockdown, this might look nice, but it's a little bit boring and it's not so really motivating. If, for example, you have someone to cheer you up, if you have someone to support you, it, it's easier. But if they have a lot of people who support you, then you feel super motivated. So if you follow this kind of motivation theory, we have to support peer groups. We have to help them to form groups, to motivate each other, to collaborate, and also to, to push each other. We could also follow a third motivation theory that goes back to brain physiology. We know from brain physiology that different kind of of, of hormones, different kind of substances in our brain make it more or easy, more easier or more difficult to learn or to remember something. So when you're angry, when you have negative emotions, you might not so easily learn. For example, if you have positive emotions, you might make use of humor as John Olive was doing in his last week tonight shows, then things might be better remembered, and also the motivation might be higher. So when we use this theory, we could use humor, we could use positive emotional anchors to link our content to the emotions of students. There's a fourth approach, and I talked to a guy who works in the area of nonprofit management, and he, he told me a very interesting story. In nonprofit organizations, he said, you cannot motivate people at all. There is no chance to motivate people. People are motivated or they are not. The only thing that you can do is you can provide an environment that offers purpose and structure. So he says, it's very easy to demotivate people if they don't know the purpose. Why am I doing this? Why am I supposed to do that? Why am I forced to do that? Then they don't see the purpose and they're demotivated. Or if they don't see the structure. So if you end up with things that don't make any sense to your students and where they end up in chaos, you demotivate them. But purpose and structure itself is just a framework. He says, you cannot motivate anybody. You're motivated or not, but you have to take care of all the motivation that you get and do not demotivate people. And there's a fourth debate, which is about in intrinsic 
or extrinsic motivation. I don't want to go too much into details, but I think it's important to have this kind of framing when we talk about motivation today. What do we mean by motivation? And we will see how our different speakers implicitly or explicitly understand motivation. So who are our speakers today? Let me briefly introduce them. We have two uh, friends from BML Munjal University in India, Yashkiran Arora and Payal Kumar. Uh, they already, uh, we were already in touch with them for several months. Uh, we had very nice exchange and discussions and they also attended some of our previous webinars. Uh, we ha uh, they will talk about how to keep students engaged. Then we will have a presentation of Leonardo Caporarello from Bocconi University, where he's head of the Bocconi Learning Lab, and he will talk about simulations and games. And then we have the fourth contributor, Robert Kotz-Freudinger, from St. Gallen University in Switzerland, and he will shift the view from motivating students to instructors' motivations. So what do we have to do to stay motivated on our own? This is what you can expect today. Whenever you have a question, whenever something uh, seems interesting, important, questionable, or where you'd say, no, a different opinion, please write it into the group chat because we will collect these contributions. Perhaps some of the speakers will spontaneously take up your suggestions, your questions. Perhaps some, some questions will be kept for the Q&A later on. Barbara will take care of that. So without any further ado, let's ask our friends from India for their presentation. Payal, Yashkiran, the floor is up to yours. To you. Thank you, Professor Andre, and um, for inviting us. And thank you, Barbara, for organizing this. Um, I'll just find the PPT and put it on the slide sharing. OK, so I hope that's visible. So we keep being told um, that, you know, this is the new normal. So what exactly is the new normal? What is normal anyway, right? I mean, that itself is so debatable. So for in the corporate sector, we, I understand after talking to a lot of people that the new normal seems to be that managers just don't really know how to handle a completely virtual team. And they're asking for screenshots of their team members on the hour, every hour. So, I mean, I, I can't even comprehend that, right? And when it comes to um, professors, you know, we were just suddenly thrust into this um, online teaching environment. If I can just share the experiences of our university, uh, it's called BML Mundial University, which is funded by a very large industrial group. They run the Hero Company, which is the largest two-wheeler manufacturer in the world, probably you've heard of it. Um, so what happened is it was a Friday somewhere in March when suddenly we were told that there's a lockdown and the Haryana government has said everybody has to go home and the university has to shut down. Ours is a fully residential um, university where there's usually about 3,000 of us milling around on campus. Um, you know, we have a school of engineering and technology, school of management and school of law. And so what we did was we sent all these students home and pan India, they started traveling all over India. And the, we stayed behind as faculty and all Saturday we trained on Zoom and whatever. And from Monday we were at our own home places, our homes, and we carried on you know, our classes. We didn't have a single day's interruption, uh, but we were still learning ourselves, isn't it? One thing is to learn how to operate Zoom and uh, you know the G classroom and many other formats, but the other thing is to actually um, keep your class motivated and that became a passion for us. We started discussing it with other people. So what I'm going to present today is a little bit about hacks, things that have worked for me and things that seem to have worked for other professors that I've been talking to. I know one of your last sessions was on humor um, in the classroom, humor and distant teaching, uh, which is great. Humor always binds us together and um, as long as it's not, you know, targeted at some group too much and, um, it can help you bond with your classroom very, very well. But then the point is that if you have cameras off, how, how do you know that people are laughing at your jokes? <laughs> very often you may just end up laughing at them and not even understand how they're being received, right? So while humor is a craft that needs practicing, and this was mentioned in the last webinar, and uh, there are instances and studies of students who are involved in writing comedy scripts and they were shown to have a greater understanding of the certain topic that they were um, dealing with. 
But my question is that, you know, how can you pull this off in an online classroom? It, it really gets difficult because you don't get reactions. So right now also I'm seeing a lot of blank screens. So I don't know, I mean, are people listening to me? Unless somebody sends an emoticon or something like that, you know, it's very different. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> There's a face. So, um, you know, so that's my point. We're not used to that, right? We're, we're used to seeing our students in front of us, whether they are undergraduates, postgraduates, mature students. And we all know that the greatest form of communication is your body language. It's how you react. It's your, the way you twitch your face in a certain way. You can immediately tell, okay, the student's not getting what I'm saying, isn't it? And you just can't do that in an online environment. So, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, so, therefore, I'm saying that we do need to co-create. We need to learn from each other. And I, I hope that the few things I'm going to present here will be helpful. And I hope I can also learn from the audience and the other speakers. So, what I have found works for me and a few other um, professors I've spoken to is that We've started planning our classes differently, you know, because we found that students get too much um, online screen time, not just classes, but they're, they're always on their phones and, you know, all sorts of social media. So there's a lot of screen time um, and concentration can be difficult because of that. And then you don't have the usual kind of breaks, you know, walking from one classroom to another having a little chat as you go along, having a little coffee, you know, all that peer mingling. You don't have that, do you? You immediately go from one online class to another online class. So we've started structuring lessons differently. And what I found is instead of planning a one-hour class, a 50-minute class with a 10-minute break in the traditional brick-and-mortar classroom, I've now started planning 15 minutes. So if I have a one-hour class, I'll plan for every 15 minutes. So I'll talk um, with the PPT and have some discussion, but then after about 15, 20 minutes, I'll break it with something, be it a caselet, I'll explain what I mean by caselet, or a quick recap quiz, just a simple three, four questions which you can put on Mentimeter or just you know ask them to put it in the chat box, or put people into breakout rooms. That's a wonderful way to have group discussions, and then they choose someone who will represent them and come back and have a final discussion in the classroom or even short videos, you know, not, not necessarily long TED Talks, but some, it could be an animated video of just about a minute and a half or something even. Sometimes um, if you go onto YouTube, um, I found all sorts of concepts you teach about, you know, so, say you're talking about burnout. If you just search burnout, um, burnout and cartoon, there's usually somebody who's explained it really, really well in about an, a minute and a half to two minutes with nice captions and very clearly articulated, you know, similar concepts that we're talking about. So that just breaks it up. Um, what do I mean by caseless? I mean, obviously we're so used to long cases, HBR, which will probably give us pre-reading and then the class would be discussions. But here is an example of a caselet. You can just quickly read it yourself. I'll just be silent for a second. So if anybody would like to answer in the chat box, what should Sanjeev do? He's a senior vice president, human resources. He found inequity in terms of the pay structure between the females and the male supervisors. There was equally qualified, same positions, but the women were getting less when he looked at the pay records. So what should he do? I mean, should he keep quiet? Should he do something about it? Nobody seems to be complaining. Do we have anyone who would like to venture to answer something or the other? Doesn't matter if you don't want to, but this is an example of a caselet, right? This is what I mean by case. So it's just a very small hypothetical situation. So there are usually many people that come up, some students will say he should do nothing. Then I ask them, why do you say that? But it's still unfair and whatever. Some people say gradually increase the female supervisor salary. A third option is increase salaries immediately. And sometimes they'll say, call in all the female supervisors and discuss with them and jointly ask what they should do. So, you know, there's various different answers and then we'll discuss exactly why do you think this is so, right? Um, so this is just an example of a caselet. We've got some here. Uh, talk to all supervisors and make them feel that they're part of any potential. Yeah, give them a feeling of ownership. Yeah, that'll be a very good answer. 
uh, reaffirm equality policy and also reaffirm equity. You know, that this case slit also brings about difference between what we mean by equality and equity, isn't it? Um, so, you know, it just could be a very small case let uh, which brings home a point and leads to a, you know, two, three minute discussion. So that's what I do. Um, so why do we bother doing all of this? You know, first of all, I mean, why do we need to keep the students motivated online? Obviously for concentration, if they don't concentrate at all, then how do they learn? Student engagement and by breaking it up with little discussions, um, you know, hopefully it leads to better learning and it leads to that peer learning that they seem to miss out on in the brick and mortar classroom. I'm just going from here. So the other reason is, you know, why should we bother doing this? Why should we bother about the student motivation in an online classroom is that, you know, it helps to keep us motivated. And I think these two things are so interrelated. Um, I know the speakers later on are going to talk a little bit about faculty motivation, but you know, if the teacher is a teacher, highly motivated teacher obviously leads to better childhood experiences and motivated students lead to you know, the teacher being much more uh, motivated and better, better performance, should I say, right? So um, it is very important. And in fact, I keep changing the form of pedagogies I use uh, year on year because, um, because I get bored. <laughs> so if, if I get bored, then my students are definitely going to get bored. So I, I actually do it for my own, you know, keeping myself really active and busy and interested. And then if I am, then I'm pretty sure it would have that, um, you know, ricketing effect, hopefully. I mean, I get a high... Uh, student rating, so it should be. And so in our university, we believe in 40% um, experiential learning, which means learning by doing. Um, so it's not just completely theoretical based. I mean, I teach MBAs and uh, PhD scholars, but I'm currently talking about the MBAs. So you can see some pictures over here. There's a, a course I was teaching, which is called Personal, um, Excellent, Personal Journey for Excellence, because our vision and mission is to create um, ethical leaders. So you can see they're doing some painting. I've given them... Um, three hours and, uh, you know, paints and paper and all that. And the title was just simply, who am I, right? It, it was a reflective course for them to think about who they are and how, how they could present it on a painting. And it was very, um, you know, the, the, initially they couldn't understand why this was happening, but later on when we discussed each and everybody's, um, you know, paintings, they really appreciated it. And I mean, a couple of them actually broke down. It led to some, um, you know, kind of a, uh, one of them had never ever painted in his life. So to him, it was an extremely emotional experience, you know, so it was quite interesting. And the, the other thing I used to do is uh, theatrical performances, you know, like, for example, the, the students on the stage, they're enacting Tuckman's, um, you know, four stage of team development, uh, forming, norming, storming and all that. You know? So they're in a certain time limit and they've been given some props. So we can't do that really on, on the online. Uh, as well as what we would do in the brick and mortar classroom. So what we've done is now we've brought in um, gamification, you know, which brings in simulations. I just have another two minutes, hopefully. Uh, simulations, it brings in, uh, you know, they can play games on their own in their own time, which teaches them, teaches them about team experiences, leadership experiences. So we're trying to replicate that in a different way. And also, this is my last slide, um, they're going, we also get them to do things like video projects and we ask them to put up things on YouTube and um, blogging also. So I'm going to finish that. I'm to just Karen, my colleague, who's going to carry on. Uh, but just very quickly before I finish, I just want to end by saying we're in the, currently doing two books. I'm doing this with some um, American professors. One is on asynchronistic and synchronistic teaching and, you know, how it the challenges and the, the latest empirical studies on that. So we'll be putting out a call for chapter soon. And the other one is about um, you know, emotion in the classroom. So I just wanted to mention that very quickly. Over to you, Jaskaran. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and a uh, very good day to everyone uh, across. Uh, what you see on your slides is how a frustrated day in a class, uh, in a life of a teacher would be looking at a set of students like this, right? No, supposedly, suppose we are in a face-to-face -face class and we see students in this mode. May I please request all of you to share what would you do? So you go to a class to take a very interesting topic and you see a class sitting like this. 
what would you do in a face to face classroom <laughs> right so buy a red bull give them a break perfect and anything else so you can think of your own subject give them a break start with an activity ice breaker open the window tell them a joke bang on okay let them stand up and do yoga great thank you so very much uh, i think uh, this this is uh, amazing thank you so much for your responses ask them if the exam absolutely absolutely but now the pain for all of us and initially when barbara asked that why are we here in the first place in this uh, session is it to learn is it to share and most of the responses were around to learn how do we engage students but the sad part of the story is in a online class this scene is not visible to us we do not know if a student is sitting very excited there in the class right or is uh, in the bed with probably the device in the hands and almost about to doze off right or is blank and is uh, not up for what is coming next so how as teachers do we in the first place know what is the mood of each student right and now if i may please have your permission to draw your attention to the student perspective of things so in a class typically i'm sure as teachers so often uh, uh pile if you could just stay with that slide for a moment okay okay <laughs> right thank you so much so uh, if from a, a student perspective uh, if we look at in the classroom when we go to a class usually do you ever find a pin drop silence hardly ever right they are giggling they are talking they are together they are enjoying each other's presence but here in an online class the students too are sitting in the rooms alone right probably they have this very interesting and compelling video game the next level to be taken up but here now they are required to attend our class so as a teacher what do we do right so yes pile thank you so much so if now we could uh, maybe change the slide uh, so what this particular slide highlights and that very interestingly uh, andre did not take it up there uh, i would have lost my uh, magic hair so uh there is this one very interesting study conducted long time back but it kind of brings forth a very interesting view point the category of the students that we typically have in a class so there are these students who are driven by marks anything that is assessed they are interested anything howsoever important it might be to the teacher for the uh, achieve attainment of intended learning outcomes the students are not interested but if it's graded whatever it is they are there with all the red blue or uh, uh, the red bull down their throat and hyperactive to listen to all of us and there is this another set of students who have a high intrinsic uh, commitment to the course they are simply passionate about the course but the moment you we as teachers expect them to write some assignments no nah, they're not interested right so there are these students who have uh, um, a withdrawal symptom um low on intrinsic low on extrinsic factor and the ones which are highly committed high uh, level of commitment in terms of their interest in the subject and also their interest in getting good grades so we as teachers all of us here how do we ensure that we are able to engage and hook all these set of students irrespective of which quarter do they belong to right and this is where uh, if i may bring your attention to uh, the next slide which is john bigs theory of constructive alignment so all the hacks that pile initially mentioned in the start of the session be that case lets uh be that um breakout rooms be that 
the student response system using padlets, mentimeters, uh, pole everywhere, so on and so forth. So the idea is, as teachers, can we have our sessions prepared with a castle top approach? Castle top approach, which essentially means a 10 minutes of whatever needs to be shared, discussed with them, followed by a peak, which is some kind of activity. Now, this activity, why? It should appeal the students with high extrinsic motivation. Assessed. So if we do not have marks, guinea points. By the end of the session, you are required to earn five guinea points or whatever that element might be. And at the same time, an activity that is very, very interesting, something interesting enough to keep the commitment of the students with high intrinsic commitment level high, right? So the idea is we as teachers, you know, we have kind of become the superman and the superwomen, uh, wherein we, we, are we are made responsible to create an environment where the learner is in a sense trapped and finds it difficult to escape without learning what he or she is intended to learn. Now you might ask, is that possible? Come on. Face-to-face -face classroom, we can see their expressions, right? But in an online mode, that's not uh, possible. I'm not very sure. In your experiences, if uh, the students usually keep their videos on or off, uh, but here uh, and to all, all the professors that we have spoken to uh, across globally, they say that no, it's kind of not mandatory in any classroom uh, for the students to keep the videos on, right? But uh, the next slide uh, shares a very interesting and a very recent research, uh, which uh, talks about transferring interactive activities in large lectures from a face-to-face -face online. And if I may draw your attention to the finding, which says uh, there could be individual differences in the student behaviors. There could be differences in different cohorts, but there is no difference in the attainment of uh, intended learning outcomes and student behaviors between different learning environment. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that it is all about how the classroom is or orchestrated and be that in an online or an offline mode. I'm hating myself to say this, but the research shows that we as teachers have to spend three times more time and planning in designing an online class versus a face-to-face -face class because here we are not only to think like a student but more importantly see how am I going to create activities which are going to gauge the student interest in the subject so all said and done the win lies uh, in incredible amount of hard work, but most importantly, making the classes as engaging as they would have been into the face-to-face -face classroom. Uh, that's it from me. I, I hope uh, I've been able to kind of uh, give some perspective to the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yashkiran and Payal. I would now like to hand over to Leonardo. He will continue with um, student simulations and gaming to keep motivation high. All right, thank you. And uh, give me just one second, please. There we go. Okay, great. So, uh, well, first, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And there have been already a number of uh, inputs so that my previous speaker has already actually landed there. So let me try in this next 15 minutes to share also maybe, I hope so, a few other uh, contributions and perspectives on how to create uh, uh, a kind of a learning experience that can be highly 
uh, effective in terms of engaging people and then keeping them motivated. Uh, before jumping to this, um, and uh, we, I will skip this agenda, but let me say one thing. Uh, a, 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 whatever is the type of motivation we're talking about is actually finding good reason for each of our learner uh, in terms of why I should f- uh, follow you within the next uh, session. This can be 15 minutes or it can be 20 or an hour or whatever this will be. So <laughs> we, it is very important that we prepare any specific learning methods per, per session that is actually really uh, useful in addressing this uh, really in the very end, uh, precise question. So why my students should, fo- should follow me? You know, in order to avoid basically that they s- uh, fall into sleep or they get distracted or defogs and do something else. Now, so one possible way to do this, it's also using, getting there or making them more aware about how much they are prepared on that specific subject, on that specific topic. There was one comment in the chat. Uh, uh, there was uh, some of you were asking uh, how to keep adults learner like engaged, right? And so what I'm going to say, I hope this can be useful for older type of training, but also for undergrads for any any level basically. But I, 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 I want also to touch the older type of learners. And so what I want to say is, so one possible way for getting there aware how much they are ready or not for dealing with that specific topic can be the use of simulation. So, and that's my first, um, let's say um, uh, my first assumption. The second one, I have three in total, and then I jump to the topic. The second assumption that we know, learning is a process, so it's not something that happened just in a single moment, and this happens in real life, is personal, so it's very highly related to single individuals, and this is going to happen uh, eventually into a, a social context. Now, nothing to, nothing new, no broken science, I know, but this is a, a second assumption I kindly ask you to keep in mind uh, so this can be helpful also in understanding my next things. The second thing I'd like to say, again, still in terms of assumptions, that one uh, has been already uh, mentioned, uh, the importance of understanding our learners, who, who they are. So here I'm just mentioning one single thing. The research is a little bit wider than just the, sig- the single figure here. But uh, uh, what we have done, this has been recently uh, presented like last year during a conference, uh, we were analyzing the differences in terms of learning styles or the preferences in terms of learning styles, uh, understanding uh, different people, students belong to different uh, batch or different uh, generations, basically. So as you see here, ranging from uh, generations and people and up to the uh, people belonging to the generation X or the baby boomers. And basically, if I can just give you the big picture, the one highlight out of this research, is that as you see on the very left side of this uh, chart over here, we have people belonging to the Z generation, sorry, to the X generation or the baby boomer. They have a kind of preference, a dominant preference for acting much more in an accommodating way. I will give you a couple of words about what does accommodating refers to and uh, why if we compare this with people belonging to the Z generation. So as we know, people that w- were born between the very end of the 90s and 2010, they have this dominant uh, preference for having learning style that belongs to what we say, uh, what we call in the literature as assimilating. In other words, uh, if I can uh, give you the short version of this uh, single findings, basically uh, uh, using or based on, on our results, uh, Generation Zers learning is basically activated when abstract conceptualization and reflection observation come into play, and that describes the assimilating profile, <clears throat> while the contrary, if we look at the more senior generations, like again, people belonging to baby boomers or Gen X, it seems they rely much more on the concrete experience and active experimentation, much more than actually people belonging to Z and millennials do. So this calls for the accommodating profile. Now, I don't want to deep dive too much in this, maybe it can be of our interest or not, but what I want to say is uh, that this is, this is my second pillar that is extremely important. And the moment we design any session and also when we decide to use any caselet, as was already mentioned, or any type of other methods, even any type of uh, game or simulation, it is extremely important that we customize it according to the audience and the target we want to use it with. I'll be more precise in a, in a few minutes. So generally speaking, at the moment we think of any uh, simulation, and here I'm talking more specifically about web-based simulation and uh, other type of business games. Uh, Basically, they are a working representation of reality. That's the domain I'm talking about. And uh, they can be very beneficial for our learners at the moment you allow them to 
leave a potentially even very high complex real life situation first and second to explore different scenarios and outcomes so they can experience all the cause and effects relationships, what you do. And so they also can practice and maybe again, if they get feedback on a continuous basis, they can get more aware about what they're doing if they're succeeding or eventually not. And so they can give you more focus and understand the theory behind of, of what happened there. So maybe they can improve it and do, uh, make it better next time. And number three is also experiencing uh, their skill set and can be on the technical dimension or on the behavioral dimension, uh, uh, given that specific online context. So those are a few uh, good reasons uh, or pillars of how we can actually look at this type of learning method. And uh, so if I have to share why uh, it, it, uh, using simulations within our learning uh, experiences could really contribute to making people first engage and second motivated, uh, you may only refer to this um, list of five things uh, as like a checklist if you like most. It's uh, ask yourself in case you're already using any simulation if, if first, what is the viability of this? So is it available and accessible to all your students? Don't keep for granted that if it is online, then people can access this without any type of constraints in terms of bandwidth or in terms of security or other type of policy. It seems a very little detail but this can compromise in trial your session if you're just drawing their link. People say, hey, get online and you practice and do something. Uh, so this requires uh, also uh, um, testing and other type of things beforehand. Second, try to make it real. So realism is important. So it can be also, I know if it's a game kind of something uh, that can be in a different planet or in a different world, whatever it is, but then try to make something that can understand there is a, a, is a type of application. Uh, try to make people engage in this. So people, they have to do things. So they have to cognitively think about something and then they have to act or react to something. Uh, provide them continuous feedback. That's the fourth very important things anytime you're using simulation. Don't give feedback at the very, just the very end. It's very high likely recommend that you do feedback ongoing. And again, the last thing is application integration. You may want to allow people, learners, to apply and try to integrate uh, what they have already in terms of background or experiences or theory they have in mind, yes. try to make them apply this into that specific context. And they want to see how this application of my previous background, again, can be a practitioner or a theoretical one, is really contributing to make this experience succeeding or not. And um, uh, changing a little bit perspective, so also looking, this is a look, something that comes from, let's say, the literature. Then we have a look uh, very quickly. Now let me tell you how to read at least one interesting finding from this chart over here uh, from, from the corporate. It was already mentioned, you know, from, so if we look from the corporate point of view or the company point of view, how do they expect that this type of method can actually become part of the uh, portfolio of the learning leaders that actually they may want to see in any type of training initiatives. Now, of course, uh, this this chart is representing only the delta. So, how much do they expect that the that the increase in the next future of each of those meters you see on the on this chart uh, will increase or not? Again, will evolve or not in the future? So, is the delta compared to the today to the current situation today? Now, what you can see, let's look at just these two lines: the blue one, where it's instructor led lectures. This is one way only is definitely going to fall in down and as expected, you may say. Interesting enough is the green line where you see that the medium use of the interactive and class activities within each also simulation were part of, according to the study, is going to increase and, and increasing in, in a very significant way. Medium, why in the medium? Because I would say this is my, our interpretation according to myself and my other orders, is because we need to get also confident and familiar with the use from the instructor point of view of these meters and also from the learner's point of view. So this is maybe why this type of caution in making a, in a higher medium use of, so it's not extremely, but we expect that gradually year by year, we may maybe uh, try to make a bigger use of that. Um, uh, so why a few tips on how to design, in case you are designing any simulation internally within your uh, business schools, your universities or your companies, uh, here, there are a few tips I would say to strongly keep into consideration. The first one is, of course, like any other, whenever I'm using case study, same thing. The learning outcome or outcomes must be extremely clear into my mind or any instructional designer. And also they have to, to, be, to become clear to the audience. Uh, 
Uh, this is essential. Otherwise, it becomes like, particularly if it's a game, it could be uh, misinterpreted, misunderstood, and it's, it's something, okay, nice, so it's funny, but maybe it's not enough. Second, uh, you may want to use simulations uh, when some desired competencies, and they can be, again, behavioral, technical, can be considered like uh, complex. That's another good reason uh, where you can uh, successfully apply simulations because they help you in putting hands on and, and putting the, the main problem into some, some segments or the smaller segments. You must take into consideration the, as I already say, uh, participants' characteristics and also try to create context that is perceived by them as relevant, as I say. Number four, if you want to not only design from the pedagogical point of view, but also from the technological point of view, you want to have a team uh, uh, with a diverse uh, number of competences and highly specialized. You see just mentioned a few of those profiles. So you want to be part, you want to have people within your team they have expertise in terms of learning designer, project managers, game designer, if it's a game, uh, coding and developers, UX and UI designers, and of course, subject matter experts. Just to mention the, maybe the most frequent profiles to have and represent within a team. Tracking the simulation process, so how the learners is progressing towards the middle final goal, this must be tracked and make it visible to your learners. And um, this is absolutely extremely important. Uh, using a simulation without a proper time for debriefing, this is killing the whole experience. So according to also to some research and to my experience, if I can put in there, it's very important that you allow proper time for discussing the whole experience of what happened, how was it, and how we can do it better next time. And then people, you will see, they will start following. And the moment you give them feedback, and this can be quantitative and eventually also qualitative, People you see, you, you immediately increase the engagement because they did something and you're providing feedback. And so now they want to know how to make it better next time. My last point here is, of course, providing in a plenary and also eventually in the small groups or individually any type of uh, detailed feedback you can provide them. And as I already say, also measuring the participants' uh, learning outcomes. So how they are now progressing thanks to this experience they have done through this uh, uh, simulation of their reality. Uh, well, this I'm going to skip this very, uh, we have done uh, experiences in, in designing and developing internally here at, at Poconi uh, and um, uh, producing more than 20 different types of simulation games in different fields. Uh, this year we had the chance uh, to be used them by more than 3,000 participants in different type of courses ranging from the undergraduates up to the uh, postgrad and executive programs. And my last thing, if I can take one more minute, if I'm not late, uh, Barbara says yes, all right. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we also need to include, at least according to me, the student's perspective. So here what you see uh, suggested super uh, first uh, initial draft outlook. It's nothing already done, so it's not a research. It, this is in progress. We're collecting, we're launching a new simulation and so we are we are in the pilot stage basically of this and so we are collecting, we start collecting some data on the, on the student's uh, experience on this. Now, we have, of course, behind the scene a theoretical model for understanding the effectiveness of this, uh, of this uh, learning needed for uh, our students. And here, what you see is that, interesting enough, we have different dimensions. I just want to uh, draw your attention on the second one that is perceived easy of use, the one that you see in orange color here. And that's interesting enough, and then you see the box also telling us the variance of. And uh, we are in, the, in that pilot stage, interesting, because they are, say, in terms of easy use, it, uh, although the perceived enjoyment and usefulness is pretty much high, it's between six and seven. But in terms of easy use, it's not bad. But that's what we are expecting, actually. We are expecting something lower than this, because uh, the user experience is still in progress at this very moment. So it's definitely consistent with. But as you see here, then we need to put this into a regression model. So our next step would be completing the data collection and doing the regression things. But the message here is, at, at least according to us, uh, we do not assume and do not fall into the trap of the bias that I know how to make things there. And so uh, I know how to design it perfectly or effectively, and that's it. Uh, try to collect perspectives and, and, and the points of view from your learners, any type of learner. Again, it can be super young or super senior. Uh, because this can help you a lot in you know, resizing the experience. And my last message, and then I'll leave the floor back to the uh, next speaker and also hopefully also the Q&A because I'm really keen to learn also from the audience today, is that one, using any simulation game is important, but as I was trying to send this few minutes speech now, is that 
you need to put this into a bigger learning experience. So according to the audience, the type of students in front of you, uh, their readiness for getting online or getting access to any technology, according to a number of factors, you want to resize the, the use of this and also using the theory. So using the simulation by itself, it's maybe not 100% effective if you don't put some other supplementary and complementary resources in order to make the whole experience effective. Uh, I would say much more effective. Um, so hopefully I'm on time. And so I leave the floor back to you, Barbara, maybe, or to my next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo, for your insights. Um, Robert will go on and switch our perspective to the instructor side of motivation. Robert, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Can I share my slides? Perfect. Here. Thanks. So, yeah, as Barbara mentioned, um, I want to change the perspective and go on to the instructor side or the faculty side of the motivation in this specific or special times right now. And this is also why I called it keeping it moving because this is, I think, really an issue with many of my colleagues or many of our colleagues right now and has been since the beginning of the spring term. So in the beginning, I wanted to, when I prepared this presentation, I wanted to talk about the research that has been done and some ideas and these things. But then I thought, no, let's make it a little bit more personal and so maybe I want to combine this presentation with a small little personal narrative. So basically what happened on a Friday evening in March, and Payal also mentioned this because I think it was maybe the same Friday evening, um, here was that on this Friday evening, we um, received the um, information that uh, we would be teaching fully online on the next Monday. So this was the idea here. Spring term was going on already for one month. I was teaching two courses on psychology at St. Gallen University. And then we had to change to online teaching over the weekend because the next day, the Monday actually looked like this. This is a um, actual picture from University of St. Gallen. And what I did, and I think I'm not the only one at my university and neither at other universities, was that I had my first reactions for sure. It was like maybe like a panic reaction, which was to adapt to the situation. So I uh, was more or less quick about learning about the conferencing tools that our university offered us and still offering us. I tried out some new feature or a new platform or a new digital tool each week. And I have to mention here that I was not uh, accustomed to this. So really many of these things were new because I was really used to teach face-to-face -face in the physical room as many of you and of us, I guess. And as I'm working in an education development unit at my university, I was also trying to support my colleagues with my new insights, with the new ideas about the digital teaching and learning. Basically, what, was, what happened in spring term was that I got the work done, but from a day-to-day -day basis. And in general, I would say that this was quite successful. The students were relieved that we could go on teaching, even the remote exams worked. And as you can see here from just some examples, most of the students liked it, what we did. So in fact, it was a positive experience in spring term. Then, um, however, late realizations, uh, when preparing for the fall term during summer, I uh, felt that something was not right. And I anticipated missing things, actually. And what did I miss? I missed the students' faces. Some of you already mentioned the black screens that we're looking into right now as well, at least the most of them. Uh, and there are good reasons for this. I mean, there's many good reasons and explanations why students don't uh, share their uh, personal space in the face with us during teaching. I was um, missing or I anticipated missing the um, information exchanges, the, um, the exchanges between the students with the students at the breaks, at the informal exchanges, these kind of things. And also I anticipated missing the body work that is usually connected to my teaching. So as you maybe see right now, I'm also trying with gestures and moving around. And this is something that is connected to the body. And I think one of you, one of the other speeches already uh, mentioned this, that this is really something emotional and um, connected to the body, even teaching. And uh, now I'm, or I was in a maybe positive situation, you could say. Having done research on instructors' emotions myself, I did what uh, is expected of many academics to do in the first place, 
which is looking for answers in research. And um, here are three aspects that I would like to share with you. And then I would like to know, of course, what you are thinking about this and how you as instructor, as faculty member, are dealing with this. So what I did first, I looked into our own research and older research about higher education instructors' emotions. And what I found, again, it was the model that one of my PhD students um, developed in, their, in her research. And this model, I don't want to bore you with the details too much. I'm having another slide presenting this in a moment where I draw the, the results and the conclusions from this. And in this research on instructors' emotions, you can really see that instructors experience a lot of emotions during their teaching, and especially they experience positive emotions. And this is also already the next slide here. Emotions are elicited by cognitive appraisals of situations. So we know now from research, from empirical, psychological, mainly research, that the subjective value and the subjective control appraisals or estimations or cognitive estimates are what determine emotions in general, in the general population, but as well in university instructors. Then second, we know that emotional traits, so the emotions, the emotional habits, you could say, differ between people and also influence or moderate emotion elicitation as well in university teachers. And I already mentioned the positive emotions, emotions conducive or, or helpful for teaching quality are generally positive emotions, such as joy, enjoyment. They don't have to necess necessarily be connected with a high arousal component, but they need in general be positive. And these positive emotions, this is also what research shows us, are usually elicited by the social interaction with the students. And what I took uh, for, my, for myself from these insights, you could say, uh, for the first, I had lost, and this was my self-reflection part here, the feeling of control. I really tried hard to get it back. So really tried hard to um, influence and, and make, for example, use constructive alignment that the other colleagues talked about earlier uh, to really connect my teaching with the students' learning and the exams and these things. Um, but I had lost the ah. subjective feeling of control. Maybe I wasn't control. No. Ah. But I, so now I'm hearing somebody else talking. <laughs> Maybe you could turn the, the mic off. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. So I had my subjective feeling was connected, um, was lost, you could say. To the seconds, I know that my emotional traits tend towards the negative. So this means, in fact, that I need, I'm even more dependent on the positive state, on the positive emotions. And the third, this I already mentioned, somehow I had missed the usual positive emotional states because I had missed the interaction with the students. So then I went on and I went to the research on university instructors' motivation. And again, that's a more or less complex model here. And again, I don't want to bore you with going too much into detail here. But maybe you have time later to look uh, to look it up when you maybe get the slides. Uh, but the main things, the main three things that we can um, derived from this research is that motivation is determined largely by the subjective expectancy or the subjective probability of being a, you could say, successful instructor or teacher. The second thing is that the quality, the type of achievement goals for a very specific situation for this current actual um, course where I'm teaching, this is again another very important component which influences the instructor motivation. So. Uh, the researchers talk about different kinds of achievement goals, but especially of value are the task approach and the appearance approach goals. And approach goals are generally goals that are uh, directed towards some positive end state, you could say. Whereas avoidance goals are directed away from a negative end state. And the third thing that you can find here is self-determination and somebody else, some of the other speakers already mentioned intrinsic and extrinsic, this, this differentiation between the two types of motivation. But self-determination theory especially states that the intrinsic motivation, the enjoyment of the task itself, and the extrinsic internal motivation, that these two kind of motivations are the most yeah, conducive or positive uh, types of motivation um, that are helpful for uh, quality of teaching. What is extrinsic, extrinsic internal motivation? This is motivation that are goals or tasks that I as an instructor integrate into my own personal self-concept. So for example, if there's something that my university or the students or somebody else um, tells me to do, then it depends on how much, on the level of how much I integrate this, this task or this aspect to my own 
um, self-concept. And now apply to my own situation here, obviously my expectancy, my subjective expectancy was under pressure. Can I really deal with this? Can I really deal with the online teaching here? Am I really doing enough to keep stu students engaged, for instance? And the second, I realized that my achievement goals had actually changed. So from a strong task approach uh, goals, which are usually, usually what I'm used to, as you, <laughs> you could say, to avoidance goals. I did not want to lose the students or I did, I did not want to lose the course because I really wanted to keep up with the course. So as I mentioned, from day to day preparation. And the third thing here is I had really lost the joy of teaching, as I mentioned earlier, with the emotions. So there was not much intrinsic motivation left and uh, as for the extrinsic internal motivation I did not my, I did not see myself as an online instructor because I was brought up and trained to be an instructor in a physical room so I was teaching because I had to teach because I had to finish this semester which is clearly extrinsic external and which is not the kind of motivation that is conducive to teaching quality let me add another third thing here that I uh, checked with the, with the research on online teaching. There's university online teaching, there's a lot of research here, but one interesting thing about the acceptance of technology, which is really strikes me, and this is another model here, um, is that most of these studies uh, find that technology acceptance is heavily influenced by the instructor's decision making or the autonomous decision making. Um, apparently, teaching online had not been my choice because uh, we all were more or less forced to this. But maybe there was some kind of autonomy about the specific tools or the specific platforms that we're using. And right now, here we are meeting on Zoom. And this is also the platform, platform that my university offered to us uh, very fast and very quickly. But maybe I, have, I do have some choice, some autonomy uh, with choosing the tools and the platforms here. So now I talk the whole time about myself and I'm of course interested in how you did and how you are doing keeping your motivation during the current online or emergency remote teaching. And I want you to use maybe the next two minutes to share your ideas um, on this platform here. This I just posted the link in the chat forum. Uh, maybe take one minute and uh, open this platform and share just your ideas. You may um, add the, your ideas, your very practical ideas, how you keep up with your own motivation, how you uh, guard your own motivation, what you're doing for your own motivation. Um, you can connect these to the theoretical concepts that you find on the website, but only also you can just add it to somewhere else. So this would be very nice of you. And uh, while you're doing this, of course, I want to share with you my ideas of what I'm finally doing with my own motivation here. And for this, I will uh, just add uh, some aspects here. So about my personal current situation, um, I mentioned this expectancy component. So the subjective idea, the subjective estimation of how successful you are as a teacher. And in order to keep up this and in order to keep high this aspect, I'm continuously learning about online teaching and learning. So I took up a course in online teaching and learning so that I can really be more the expert on these things, maybe similarly to how I've been an expert before to the face-to-face -face physical learning. Um, another aspect is that I'm changing or that I had been changing, I'm still changing the course setup, really the general setup of the course. So as mentioned earlier by some of the colleagues, I was at, I'm still adding asynchronous um, versus synchronous elements to my courses. I'm playing around with the fun parts of the online teaching. And also I try to connect even more with the students now, even if online and, and virtual and digital, but this, as I realized, is really important to my motivation. And the other thing is, I remember that the emotions, especially the emotions, but also the motivation are highly connected to the body and to the social. So what I did now is I took up regular walking scheme so that I'm really actually moving my body every day, uh, either with my husband or some other positive people. And as you can see here, this picture is actually taking from the current situation right now in St. Gallen. So there are some really nice spots where you can go, where you can walk, where you can move your body. And generally, I try to experience at least one positive, and positive usually for me is a new thing, so a new thing each day that I, that I really like. And the last part here, the last element, is that I try to continue learning about myself with an experimental mindset, so try out different things, self-reflect my experiences, mentioned before as well, and 
of course, share these ideas and these experience with other instructors, with my colleagues, with instructors at my own university and other universities. Thanks a lot for your perspective. I'm really looking forward to um, looking on the website, on this Padlet website now, and uh, maybe we can have a talk about these things and be more specific about how we motivate ourselves and what we can do to guard and keep up with our motivation. Thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. Uh, thank you, Robert. I'm sorry. I'm already um, thinking of, um, thank you for your insights. I'm, I was already thinking of the first questions uh, that were asked uh, in the chat. And we will continue with the Q&A session. If everyone's fine with that, and I want to give the the word um, no slides now. Thank you. Um, I will give the word to Leonardo. Um, there was a question: um, if you could shortly um, clarify the term of simulation and if the games that you are using are competitive ones. Sure. Uh, all right. Yeah. What, what when I was talking about sim web-based simulations, I was referring to any any type of online environment where actually participants can log in and they get the information and inputs that can be via super visual charts. And I'm not talking only about text based things. So you are starting experiencing kind of, uh, it can be business or not business situation and participants are then required to analyze it, interpret data or interpret the phenomenon and eventually taking some decisions based on such decisions, then something happens. So the situation may evolve accordingly. And so like in the reality, and like if you, I mean, it can be team management, it can be a negotiation. I'm just mentioning a few of the topics I'm, uh, I used to teach frequently. So based on these decisions, if you're driving a team towards a specific uh, direction, uh, based on what you have decided, something happens. So then some of your team members eventually come back to you because they are complaining or because they are not happy with this or this or that. So that the kind of situation, and then you take another bunch of decisions and things will move like this. Uh, if you are tracking all the decisions and there is a theoretical model behind the scene, at the very end, you can have like a dashboard or recap page where you can see all the progress uh, by each learner and you can also aggregate data and you can also provide it first a general feedback to everyone like in a planning session and then eventually you can also go for individual feedback in order to give uh, to each of them uh, some of uh, areas to be improved according to some theory or you can make a individual recommendations, hey, you can go and review session number three, or I have something for you, that's a reading for you article, so you can provide really individualized type of feedback. Um, I'm not sure if it's not, uh, hopefully it's more clear either or, or, or the other colleagues. Uh, so what I was referring when I was mentioning about this and going back to the second question, uh, games were, games are, we have actually, uh, um, uh, games, they have to be competitive and the competition can be so differentiating games uh, from simulations where the competition is not an accessory condition. Talking to games, that was the question. We have, we have games where actually the participants are uh, competing against, let's say, a, a, a simulated other counterparty or a simulated environment. Or we do also have uh, other type of competition where actually people organizing teams or even individually uh, spread out around the, the different continents or countries. They are just uh, working together, working in a collaborative way or in a competing way. So it depends actually, there's a kind of metrics we can have both situations. Uh, hope it's more clear now. Yeah. Thank you, Leonardo. If not, please, of course, let me know. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yashkiran, there were two questions, three questions to your side. Yes. Uh... So there was this one question on um, what's the proportion of the students who are uh, extrinsically motivation versus the ones who are intrinsically motivated. Um, so majority of the students, 90% plus students are extrinsically motivated, right? Um, they are doing this course and what earlier uh, Professor Andre said, the instrumental theory. So if you let them know this is something that will get them good scores and this good scores would mean a good job, a good job would mean a big house and a big car and all this charted uh, plane. Yes, that is majority of our students. And that is what actually makes our life simple and difficult at the same time. 
simple because we know what the student is wanting so there was this question um on how do they earn points so what robert just said right uh, the use of padlet is one simple example so i um, take uh, mba uh, classes with mba phd and undergraduate students i take courses like accounting finance excel spreadsheet modeling and uh, pedagogies for management teachers i conduct um pan uh country wide workshops on uh online uh, uh teaching pedagogies for effective online teaching so the use of various tools like and i was just putting this in the chat window tools like kahoot quiz is quizlet they are a very very cute competitive free apps like most of their features are free of cost and whenever i've used kahoot in the class um so it's like an online uh, quiz you may call it online competition it may you may call after each question that is projected the response and the correct responses the name of the students appear there is confetti um celebration and towards the end the top 3 uh winners of that quiz are kind of the names are shown on the podium dancing so that is something that has worked very successfully um padlets poll everywhere mentimeter and i am a big user of google suit of products yeah which essentially means simply using a spreadsheet so in my classes on spreadsheet modeling uh my life has become so much simple ever since the onset of covid because now on the screen on this shared google spreadsheet i am able to see what they've done uh so how do i give them points that we were referring to earlier right is keeping a track on google spreadsheet on the answers that are coming uh when um any online quiz is taken on kahoot or quizzes or quizlet we as instructors we get the report of correct answers we get the report of the class performance and that is something that on a live platform so i i take a quiz and i have the results here with me and immediately uh, after the quiz i can start with picking up the questions which had the least accuracy result and that is something that kind of becomes an instant feedback that earlier uh, the speakers were referring to am i making sense thank you yes kiran yes, yeah and i hope in the process i've answered all the questions that were addressed thank you i i want to pick out another question uh, it is always 10 people out of 30 who actively participate is there a way to increase the number online does any uh, of the speakers want to comment uh oh uh, if this okay can i take up that question yeah um so usually spreadsheets are a brilliant way of keeping a track of the responses so how it essentially works is i have i usually list the name of the students in the spreadsheet and i give students edit rights they are required to write the response next to their name so of the 30 students if i see that 10 students have responded next to their name uh, i can always call out the name of the students who have not responded they would either say that they, they do not know the answer or uh, um they need help with it and that is where i think um uh, uh peer community becomes very handy so nowadays with uh, of course zoom has a inbuilt feature of breakout rooms there are apps that are available uh and helps breakout rooms in even google meets uh so many such tools make it very possible so in excel class there are some students who are very advanced and there are some students who are probably are working with the laptops for the first time so i put them together in a community in, in a peer group and i uh, ask them to work together so that is something that is usually i call them buddies right i've created space for them um where they can actually meet up not disturb uh, the class per se by unmuting themselves but in the peer group they get together talk and then come back in the main classroom that is something that has worked very nicely for me yeah thank you yashkiran 
There is another question, if there is a difference between MBA and bachelor's students concerning um, interaction and so Thank you, Barbara. Um, that question's uh, directed to me, but uh, I can't really answer that with uh, reasonable experiential data because I don't teach undergrads. Um, but it works very well with, um, with my MBA students. Um, regarding the, the, the previous uh, question, you know, one, one way of including everybody is, of course, one advantage of being online is that you have everybody's name tags. <laughs> so if you have a very large class, somebody was mentioning they have an extremely large class of 200, you may not remember everybody's names, uh, but you can actually do a cold call. And so then that keeps students on their toes, doesn't it? Yeah, and then, you know, if there is some pre-read, then they better do the pre-read before they come into the classroom and things like that for discussion. Um, so, it, I mean, if one does that occasionally, then uh, I think students are much more alert. Um, that's answering the previous question. Thank you, Payal. Are there some more comments from the audience for the speaker's team? Uh, Barbara, if it's okay, I have just uh, a small um, experience. So when Robert was talking of how uh, this entire journey uh, of, of March, Friday till date has been, right? And I think it is something that is common uh, to all of us. Uh, starting from learning what WebEx or Zoom meeting was to now uh, getting on to acquiring all this technological, pedagogical know-how, right? We've come a, a big way. But then very interestingly, there is this research piece which says, even before the online platform, right, uh, all of us, the teaching fraternity, evolved in different phases, right? Uh, people who are, who are very new to teaching, their usual concern is, uh, do I know my subject? Will I be able to put it across to my audience? Will I hope I would I would be able to answer all the questions. Those are the kind of apprehensions that teachers in stage one have. Then when they kind of evolve slightly, uh, they progress to uh, thinking, okay, I know my stuff, but will the students like me, right? How do I how do I make them like me? Stage two, right? Then uh, so over these stages, the next stage is. Uh, how do I put it across to them, right? How do I kind of uh, ensure that they are learning in the process? And the most evolved teacher focus usually would be, are my students independent learners? How do kind of I excite them? How do I give them that intrinsic motivation to learn that course? And unfortunately, this entire COVID scenario has reversed get all of us, right? We are all back into uh, the point, how do I put across my point to them? So I completely understand, agree, the pain, the anguish that we're all going through. But I think uh, at this point in time, the most important thing is to release that handbrake, right? So when we have our handbrake on and we're trying to accelerate, it just won't happen. So releasing that handbrake and with a very positive mindset that this is one opportunity to make use of, right? So very interestingly, uh, I just concluded uh, a research on um, the experience. So the title of the paper is, will the teachers continue to teach even post COVID-19? Yeah, so this is, uh, of course, the study based out of in India, but we are hopeful that the results can be generalized because uh, the theory premises that cognitive dissonance, right, essentially is, is very instrumental in deciding the way forward. So people who are attempting to reduce the dissonance thinking that, oh my God, this online thing, oh God, get let the vaccine come, let everything get back to normal classes, right? If that is what we are praying and hoping, unfortunately, till that happens, this online is going to be a pain. But for all of us, and then I think I would include all of us here in this second category who have decided, okay, boss, 
online stuff is here to stay and of course it comes with added advantages why don't i learn the skills and that positive attitude automatically gets into the students and they are engaged they are as excited as we are um, yeah so that was thank you yes kiran maybe i can add one thing about this i really uh, like your perspective just kiran it's very interesting because also this is what the majority of the people here on the padlet uh, mentioned so just looking on this if you look on the on the website you can also see that really it's about turning the negative or the avoidance aspect or orientation toward a positive approach situation and some of you mentioned some things like see the positive in things don't be so strict with yourself uh, keep my good my mood positive keeping the positive mood um trying to reconnect and most of the i would say the most of the um things that you mentioned here on the padlet is also about this connection uh, building and keeping connection with the students so this really seems to be an important aspect and i really agree with you that the um cognitive dissonance is one aspect and how we deal with this negativity that we experience because cognitive dissonance is connected to negative emotions and negative effect um so how do we turn this around and this is really something that i think or from my experience is not solved yet perfectly how to do this but as you mentioned so coming back to on track this is really the uh, one of the things thanks thank you robert So I'd like I, to, I would like to ask the speakers just for one sentence in a nutshell. If a young researcher, young teacher would approach you and ask you, what shall I do in one sentence? What is the takeaway from today's workshop? What would you tell it? In, what is the most important thing? What you say? Keep an eye on that. This is the do or this is the don't in one sentence. What would you say, Robert? Yeah, I can start because it's quite easy. I would say something like know yourself and okay. get to know yourself better and better because this is really the most important thing as a researcher, as an academic, as an instructor in higher education, also the other education fields. Thank you. Leonardo, what would you say? What is the key message in one sentence? Well, to me it is uh, let's start doing things. Uh, don't, don't be afraid. Sometimes the motivation is something that lack to faculty members more than students. So let's do things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Kiran, what would you say? Uh, empathize with the students. Um, and have, get those glasses where you are able to see through this camera into what they are doing and build activities around that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paya, the key takeaway so, in one sentence? I'd say take the bull by the horns. I mean, this is a challenge we have in front of us. Uh, we can't just curl up and say, we don't want to do this. We have to do this and, uh, you know, learn ourselves. And I wish we'd had more time because I would have loved to have learned a little bit from the audience as well. I mean, I'm sure they would have some very interesting experiences which work for them in the classroom. Um, so I think co-learning also is very important. You know, keep talking to faculty around you across the world. What's working for you? What's working for us? good practices, bad practices, you know, and that really helps. But yeah, taking the ball by the horns, that it can be done, it will be done, yeah. Learning from each other, Pale, that's the perfect cliffhanger for Barbara because this is the announcement of what happens next. Exactly. So we have three, three more charts for you and, and one offer. So we invite you to join us again on the Living Innovation Platform. And you, you, you invited to post your questions regarding motivation and engagement there. Um, we ask our speakers for the next week to offer uh, the possibility to answer your questions uh, until November 25th. So please go there, post your questions. And also, if you want to share any experiences or cases regarding uh, modification, uh, motivation or even other uh, topics, Please feel free to post there. What we want to do now is to go from the synchronous discussion to an asynchronous discussion. And this will be open for a week. And during this week, we hope that you continue this discussion in a very intensive and interesting and substantial way. Our speakers, my team will be there. And let's hope that we can continue this also if we have to leave in five minutes. We have still one week to go and we would like to continue. Then we have one more thing. So this is where you find it. Yeah, sorry. I will post the links in the chat box.
Thank you, Heike. Next slide, please. Yes, we will have another webinar planned in January uh, 21. It will be uh, on the topic from emergency teaching to a long-term platform. So we want to ask the questions, how to ensure the acceptance of e-learning and bring faculty on board. So stay tuned for this um, next webinar. Date and date is not really decided by now. We'll be quite late in January. We will send you invitations. We have your email addresses. So we will approach you. You will know. And then we have one more thing to announce, which is next week. We start a new series of online dialogues on the challenges of remote working. So this is not about teaching. This is about working. Basically for us, it's always the same. Teaching is working and working is teaching in many cases. But it's also important for managers. It's also important for leaders. So we would like to address leadership challenges on the one hand. So when all it's about how to lead a virtual team, a team that's no longer there in the office, in the institute, at the university, but that's now sitting in home office in front of kitchen tables and you still have to lead this team. So what are these leadership challenges that leaders experience? So this goes from trust, well, are they really working or are they just playing around? Are they really there? Trust, creativity, Many leaders say they lost the creativity and I would say they lost it because the creativity was not well organized. It just emerged at the coffee machine and now they lost the coffee machine. The creativity is gone. So these are, and there are many more leadership challenges. And on the other hand, there are technologies out there that could help us to f fight these leadership challenges. So regarding trust, there might be surveillance if we would like to have an artificial intelligence observing us and seeing if we really work or not. There might be some new technologies as virtual reality and augmented reality helping us out with our creativity and so on. Next week, November 26th, Sabina Agner is partner of Spencer Stewart, which is a global uh, headhunting company. So she knows what she talks about because she talks with managers all around the world. Jan Hickisch, vice president of Unify, which is an Atos company. He will provide us with a technological overview, what's already there and what we could use. And Stefan Schenach is member of the Council of Europe from with a policy perspective. By now, we have 380 registrations. It's incredible. So this really, poof, getting afraid of this event, honestly. So, um, but still, it's a virtual event. And if you'd like to attend, register, join us. We're happy to meet you again. So I think that's for today. This is the website. You already know it. Let's stay in touch. Uh, if you have anything that you would like to suggest to us, what we should do in upcoming events regarding challenges in remote working, regarding smart university or any other issue around how we will live in 2030, living innovation, that's the project. You know our names, you know our faces, you know us. We would like to stay in touch. Have a good evening, have a good morning, have a good day, have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.